that have been enterprised, uh, uh, have been uh, taken, um, have been decided uh, after the First World War are collapsing. Uh, with uh, the collapse of the Iraqi and uh, uh, Syrian state and with the crisis in Turkey, I will come back to this issue, Iran is not in a crisis but Turkey is in a crisis, uh, what we had in the 1920s, 1930s, 1940s, 1950s, 1980s and 1990s are also collapsing. You don't have just one strata but all the strata of, history of the 20th centuries are, co are co collapsing. And what is also important uh, is that at least in Iraq and Syria, but also in some other countries like in Libya and Yemen, we have uh, henceforth not the rule of the Leviathan, but the rule of the behemoth, behemoth meaning the destruction of the society itself, uh, the collapsing, collapsing society. and. Vis-a-vis, -vis, oh, uh, amid this collapse of uh, social collapse, a uh, broad social collapse, we see one society emerging, and that's the Kurdish society. That's something striking. Yeah. Why the Arab societies uh, in Syria and in Iraq, uh, they collapse, uh, and why the Kurdish society, in spite of its fragmentations, uh, is remaining. Yeah. And I think that here, we have probably uh, the, the, the price of a very long century. Ibn Khaldun, the 14th century Arab thinker, uh, thought that uh, the, 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 the communities that were marginalized historically, they were the communities of the future. But probably going beyond that, uh, I will say that in Iraq and in Syria, the idea of citizenship has not taken place. Uh, the people did not defend their state. Uh, the state has always been uh, uh, accepted as an enemy force, a predatory force, and the state has been a predatory force, while in Kurdistan, whatever the criticism that you might address uh, to, PhD, to, to EPG or to Barzani or to Talabani or whatever you can imagine, there is the idea of being a part of a society. And I think that this knowledge um, of being a part of a society, being Kurd and being a part of the Kurdish society is probably one of the factors that explain why there is today the emergence of the Kurdish society. And I think that the military traditions of the past and the military traditions of the very near, near, uh, near past uh, do also play a role in the emergence of the Kurdish society. Five, four or five years ago, the Kurds in Syria and the Kurds in Iraq, actually, they thought that violence was over, that they could contain themselves in their small Kurdistan. They were not a part of the, uh, of the um, Near East or the Middle East. And with the emergence of the Islamic State, they had to remilitarize themselves. They thought that they could be a Dubai or an Athens in the region. They had to become once again spart. Sparta, what does Sparta means? Sparta means uh, the militarization of the society. This is not a good point, of course, but at the same time, this militarization was a constraint militarization, remilitarization, and we saw that this, uh, th this fact has also uh, played a role in the formation or reshaping re re of, uh, of the Kurdish issue, but it has also allowed uh, the emergence uh, of a Kurdish society. Probably the Kurdish society existed, of course, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, but a Kurdish society being aware that it is Kurdish and it is a society is a new phenomenon. Other things have changed in the Middle East. 25 years ago, 30 years ago, there were four capitals which were very important in the, in the future of the, in, in the evolution of the Kurdish uh, issue, Baghdad, Damascus, Tehran and Ankara. Of course, any historian knows any historian knows that the history is not written. The coming history is not written yet. We don't know what will be the future of Iraq and what will be the future of Syria. And uh, you cannot uh, totally exclude the possibility that the new predatory states emerge in Damascus and in in in, in Baghdad. And at the same time, my dear friend Nahro, I will agree with you. It will be extremely difficult uh, to, uh, to, to, to put together Iraq and Syria, whatever the future of the current regimes might be.
the societies have collapsed and whatever the future of the uh, the, the future of the current relationships might be uh, Baghdad and Damascus they are not anymore among the main players of the Kurdish issue while you cannot write the Kurdish history of the 1970s and 1980s 1990s uh, without uh, taking into account uh, what uh, the, the role of Damascus and uh, and uh, and uh, Baghdad. You cannot forget uh, uh, the Anfal operations. Uh, Anfal operations were decided uh, by Saddam Hussein and his cousin. You cannot uh, forget, for instance, uh, that uh, Damascus has played an important role in the implementation of PKK in Lebanon and in, in uh, Syria in the 1980s. So they were extremely important uh, players. Today they are not anymore extremely important players, at least uh, for while being. On the other side, we have two other states, Iran and Turkey, that have become probably much more dominant than before, but in a very asymmetric relation. In both countries, there is a Kurdish issue. Of course, you know that. In Iranian Kurdistan, in the Iranian Kurdistan, Kurdistan resistance is going there. This resistance is both a civil resistance. Whatever I heard from the Iranian Kurdistan shows that the Iranian Kurdistan has sociologically became separated from Iran. Of course, people speak Persian. Of course, people are aware. Of course, people vote for Rouhani at least, but not in 2009. They didn't vote for. for for any of the candidates. There is, uh, uh, th 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 there is an initiation to the social sciences uh, uh, through Persian and not directly through Kurdish, but still whatever I heard from the Iranian Kurdistan shows that sociologically you have a new entity which is quite distinct from Iran that has emerged. At the same time, you have also uh, a new resistance, armed resistance, uh, which is quite difficult to understand, but which is there. It means that, uh, to some extent, uh, militarily, in including militarily, the, uh, by, uh, Tehran is not uh, uh, yet able to control totally the region. In Turkey, of course, there is a Kurdish issue. I will not be very long because you know what happened in Turkey. Here, too, you have a sociological differentiation between Kurdistan and Turkey. Kurdistan does not belong to Turkey anymore politically, sociologically, culturally. Turkish army is there, of course. The mayors, they have been dismissed from office. But at the same time, the war is going on. And at the same time, the destructions are there, but at the same time, sociologically, politically, culturally, this part of Turkey does not belong anymore to Turkey. Uh, so, uh, both in Iran and in Turkey, you have an important Kurdish issue, and there is at once a war between Iran and Turkey and a peace and rapprochement. I think that we should really be aware that the Iranian Turkish relations are not easy relations, and in these relations the Kurdish issue plays a very important role. The war. I think that we have uh, uh, witnessed uh, during the last five years that there was a real cold war or even a warm war between Tehran and Ankara. Tehran has adopted a militia-based diplomacy. Hezbollah in Lebanon was the nucleus for the Iranian military diplomacy in the Arab world. And this uh, diplomacy is today, con is today continuing with the pop people's uh, mobilizations units in Iraq, uh, with the Houthis in, uh, in, uh, in, in, in Yemen. And probably tomorrow, in the other Gulf countries, we will have that kind of militia organizations. And these militia organizations are extremely important and dangerous, I would say, for the future of the, of the Arab societies, because you cannot have community-based militias and the idea of the state at once. The, the existence of a militia, a community-based militia, organically linked to a relig religious apparatus, is against the very idea of citizenship and the very idea of construction of a society. On the other hand, Turkey cannot develop a militia-based uh, diplomacy in the region because Turkey has no social basis at all. No Sunni community, including in Syria, expect the return back of the Ottoman Empire. 
So you have an asymmetric relations, and to add to these asymmetric relations, you have a difference, fundamental difference, huh, between the Shia radicalism in the region and the Sunni radicalism in the region. The Shia radicalism remained a mastered radicalism. You can control the Shia radicalism because you have a religious apparatus, you have a political apparatus, while the Sunni radicalism became an over-radicalism and at the end, as the Islamic State and Al-Qaeda showed it, destroyed the Sunni community itself. And what happened in Lebanon shows that clearly. So you have a war between the Ottoman Empire and Iran, Persia, and today, 500 later, you have this same war between Turkey and Iran. And actually, Iran assumes this war. Iran shows what happens today as a revenge, historical revenge, and I would say even that Iran says that time has come, came to take the uh, revenge of al qadisiyah of the yeah. <laughs> of the seventh century. So you have a war, but at the same time, there is also the possibility of rapprochement, uh, an alliance between Iran and Turkey. And I think that this alliance uh, is based um, on two points. First, the both countries are extremely anti-Western countries, and I would say that today Turkey is maybe much more anti-Western than Iran itself. Uh, in Iran, you have a political pragmatism, a political rationality. In Turkey, you don't have that. And the failure in the Middle East uh, obliged Turkey to capitulate uh, uh, vis-a-vis Russia. And today, the new enemies are the United States and Germany. So you have this common ground uh, being uh, anti-Western, but also a second anti-ground, a uh, common ground. And I think that the Kurds uh, from any country to start with, from Iran, uh, from Iraq, they are not aware of that. There is an anti-Kurdish <coughs> essence in, the, in these two countries' policies. And we saw that recently, both in Iran and Turkey, voices emerged uh, against any project of referendum in the Iraqi Kurdistan. And I think that uh, there will be both a war but also a political alliance against the formation of a Kurdish entity and, and against the transformation of the Kurds from objects to subjects, to subjects of their own history between Baghdad, uh, between Tehran and Ankara. And we should take into account this factor. What can be the answer to that? I think that the answer is the empowerment of the Kurdish society not only the Kurdish politics, but Kurdish society. We have today a regional Kurdish system, political system. This regional Kurdish political system has uh, two references, either we like that or not. That's the KRG on one side, uh, and PKK or PED, PED, whatever you can imagine, in the Rojava. That's a fact. And I would say that I both actors, they have their weaknesses, and they strength. Militarily, they strength. But we know that in Iraqi Kurdistan, we have a neoliberal, democratic, but at the same time, a patrimonial system. This patrimonial system is not able to integrate the Kurdish society fully. And we know that in Rojava, we have a resistance force. And thanks God, they resisted. And at the same time, you cannot easily say that there is a democracy in Rojava. There is a hegemonic construction. So I think that in both, in both cases, we have weaknesses and strengths. And I think that one should um, criticize um, the Iraqi Kurdish leadership um, uh, for its patrimonialism and the Syrian Kurdish leadership for its hegemonical construction. And at the same time, I would say that uh, this uh, criticism should be a constructive criticism it means that uh, allowing them to overcome their own obstacles, and more important than that they reinforce their internal collaboration. I think that without any internal cooperation, corporate, uh, co collaboration, 
between the Kurds in Syria and the Kurds in Iraq, probably we will be in a very difficult situation. I will not say that we will come back to the 1980s, uh, during which the Iraqi Kurds uh, and the Iranian Kurds were fighting each other militarily, but still I think that uh, without any uh, ac mutual acceptance, probably the situation will not be easy to, uh, to, to, to manage. We have to accept that the Kurdish society is a fragmented society that brings a lot of weakness, but that brings also strength. This fragmentation uh, does not date from the Second World War, but actually from the 17th century. Uh, the separation of Kurdistan is between Persia and Turkey is the 17th century. It has created another history. It has created different political traditions. It has created different generational phenomenon. Uh, in Iran and in Turkey or in Syria, the generation of 2009 is a generation, while in Iraq you don't have the counterpart of that. You learn uh, more and more in Iraqi Kurdistan, you don't need Arabic, you just read Kurdish. But in Turkey or in Iran, you need Persian and Turkish. So it means that this fragmentation is there. This fragmentation can be a resource rather than a simple uh, obstacle. But at the same time, I think that this fragmentation should not uh, forbid a fluidity, a continuity between the Kurdish space. The Kurdish space needs more and more internal integration. The more Kurdistan became separated uh, sociologically and politically from Iraq, from Iran, from Turkey, and from Syria, the more it has to become internally integrated. That's not nationalism, that's not exclusivism, but it means that the formation of this space uh, uh, with these different political traditions cannot be possible if there is no integration. And I will remind here, remind here in the, that in the 1920s, if Kurdistan did not exist, uh, there were many reasons, particularly because uh, European countries, France and, 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 and uh, 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 Great Britain, they were very weak after the First World War. Uh, they trusted the strong states. It means Turkey and Russia. That's why they withdrew themselves also from Caucasia and from the current Turkey. But at the same time, we know also that there was not a Kurdish unity, that Barzanji, for instance, didn't know if he was pro-British, pro-Ottoman or pro-Kurdish, that Ibrahim Hanuna in uh, Syria did not know if he was Kurdish or Ottoman or anti-French. Simko tried to deal with Mustafa Kemal, so we know that and in Turkey itself, uh, many tribes uh, that have committed and uh, participated to the Armenian genocide, uh, actually they were scared that the Armenians will take revenge. And uh, this situation, for instance, was one of the main factors that has created, uh, that, that has constituted an obstacle to the formation of the Kurdish state. In the 1980s, I am an old man, I remember many things now, uh, we were traumatized because there was a Kurdish internal, internal war. Today, I think that it is time to overcome this, uh, this fragmentation uh, or incorporate it into, in, into a political system and try going beyond the referendum, going beyond the state formation, try to empower the Kurdish society, empower the Kurdish political elite, empower the Kurdish cultural elite, not only political elite, and, and, and empower the Kurdish, Kurdish studies. And this uh, empowerment can be only possible if uh, we accept unity and fragmentation simultaneously. And many other things, the continuity between the two Kurdistan, the food autonomy. Uh, we have discussed uh, that issue a lot, uh, many times. If tomorrow there is a double uh, uh, blockade from Turkey and a uh, double embargo from Turkey and from, uh, from Iran, Kurdistan will, uh, will not survive. <laughs> uh, a strategic thinking, uh, and I think that, and probably to some extent also a share, a shared diplomacy, a shared diplomacy. I am very sad to see today that the Kurds from Syria and from Iraq, for instance, from the front okay, they did not so much participate to the campaign for the referendum. Hmm. Uh, and tomorrow, maybe, the Iraqi Kurds will not participate to the a project of referendum in Syria. So I think that we can say that a political space cannot exist uh, if there is no shared diplomacy, at least to some extent. Uh, that does not mean 
that, uh, that this diplomacy will not take into account the real political, but we can go beyond the real political. Uh, so I will stop here. I will say that, of course, the future is impossible to foresee. If you take, for instance, the Syrian war, the Syrian war has changed its shape every summer. Every summer you have a total new configuration in the Syrian conflict. The violence is so high and the actors that are involved are so numerous and brutal that the conflict itself is changed its, uh, its shape. So it will be impossible to see what will be the future of Kurdistan even in 2020. But I think that the resources are there, the moral resources, the idea of being a society, the idea of a Kurdish citizenship, which does not mean a Kurdish state. Kurdish citizenship mean, means that you as a citizen, you accept that or you think that uh, you are accountable for the future of a society. All these resources are there. The resources are there, so I think that we should uh, reinforce them and make them uh, allow them to cooperate, uh, allow them to, 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 to get in a coherent ensemble. Thank you so much for your uh, for, for listening. Yeah.